All right. Good evening, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Brian Taylor with the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. We really appreciate you joining us for our second to last uh, Water Watch lecture series of 2024. Um, before we begin, I just want to give a shout out to our sponsors uh, for supporting tonight's educational program, and that is Clean Harbors, as well as the Massachusetts Cultural Councils of Situate, Hanover, Marshfield, Pembroke, Rockland, Plymouth, and Duxbury. Uh, thank you so much for your continued support um, year after year of these educational programs. So we really appreciate them making uh, these programs possible. So um, we are excited for tonight's program. Um, tonight, uh, as uh, Mass Audubon's representative, I will be joined by Julia O'Hara. Uh, thanks, Julia, for joining us. And um, if you would like to say a couple things on Mass Audubon's behalf, you should feel free to go ahead and share your screen. And uh, um, and then we can uh, we can get going. All right, thank you so much. Um, yeah, thank you for having me and us as Mass Audubon and Mass Audubon. Um, thanks all of you guys for joining. There's 92 people in here. That's really great. Uh, so thanks for coming. I'm just gonna share my screen. And let's right. see. There we go. Uh, we have some programs coming up um, out of our North Rivers Wildlife Sanctuary in Marshfield and our Tidmarsh Wildlife Sanctuary in Plymouth um, are the closest ones to this area. Our sensory days, um, conservation starts in your backyard, talks with our uh, one of our newest employees who we're really excited about um, out of Tidmarsh. Uh, destination burning with a scone. Those programs, the scones are amazing with Doug Lowry. Awesome programs. Burning in a changing climate, burning by van, also with Doug Lowry um, and our winter lecture series. So uh, take a look at those and you can easily see these programs by going on our website. Um, so thank you in advance for supporting us. Um, I'll leave it. I'll do an awkward pause so people can read for a second and then shoot it back over to you. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Julia. It sounds good. Yeah. Um, yeah, while you're checking out those uh, great Mass Audubon programs, I will say Doug, Doug Lowry's scones are fantastic. Um, uh, I know from experience. Uh, so a couple big programs coming up. Um, here uh, at the uh, North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Well, if you're not familiar with the Watershed Association, we are a, a local grassroots nonprofit uh, whose mission is to preserve and protect uh, one of our most valuable natural resources, uh, that being water, uh, through, so through um, education, engagement, scientific monitoring and research, we strive to ensure healthy waters for people, for communities, uh, the environment, um, and, and everyone. Uh, going forward for now and for the future and so we really appreciate uh, everyone tuning in for programs um, like this um, so we will be having our gardening green expo happening on march 11th through the 16th there will be both virtual and live programs registration for that is on our website uh, and then we will also be having the annual south shore striper tournament on june 7th um, between june 7th and june 9th that's a friday through sunday um, that's over three thousand dollars cash prizes so any anglers out there that Registration is also on our website as well to get involved with the Striper Tournament. Uh, and that's all along the South Shore. It's just not, um, it's not uh, uh, specific to the watershed area. So um, with that, we're really excited for tonight's program. Um, like I said, this is the second to last one. Uh, and so tonight we are joined by um, Brian Yellen, a PhD research professor of geosciences, hydrology, and sedimentology at UMass Anhurst. Uh, Coastal Dynamics Lab. Uh, Brian is also the Fellows Program Coordinator at the Northeast Climate Adaptation Center. Uh, and so Brian Yellen has uh, put out some pretty amazing research papers, uh, as well as led a few programs, one with the watershed a couple years ago that I attended. So uh, we are really excited to have Brian here to share his expertise on the North and South Rivers. And uh, as we take a look at some historical um, elements, as well as some future elements as well. So um, Brian, I will pass it over to you. Uh, the floor is yours. And thanks so much for joining us tonight. Great. Thank you so much for that introduction, Brian. And um really exciting to hear about all the cool stuff happening, Julia. So I'll go ahead and share slide and then I'll start talking because I can't, you know, chew gum, etc.
All right. Um, so yeah, thank you again for having me. Um, super excited to give this talk. Really excited to be here. And um, it's just such an amazing watershed, the North South Rivers Watershed. So uh, sorry, the North South Rivers Watershed. Um, one thing I wanted to say before I jump into it is I am passionate about watershed groups and water conservation. Um, I have my own. I shouldn't say I have, but I helped start a watershed group here in Western Massachusetts for our local watershed called the Fort River Watershed. We're really committed to water quality issues. Um, that all being said, I'm very passionate about the mission of the North South Rivers Watershed Association um, and excited to get to be a part of it. Um, as Brian said, um, my research group at UMass has been working um, diligently in the watershed for a little while now, um, but I'll pause and speak to this intro slide. I'm going to apologize. My slides are on my second monitor, so I'll be looking that way a lot. Um, so yes, my, the, the talk is about the legacy of the Portland Gale, but I'll speak a little bit more broadly about other work we've been doing in the region. Um, before I jump into it, um, we're going to start with an audience activity. I didn't know what our engagement would be. Um, it's kind of limited because um, there's no chat and stuff. But you can just talk to the person next to you or yell to the person in the next room. Um, question, um, what is the difference between these two images? So we're looking at um, the outlet of the north-south rivers. So this, this channel up here is the, do I have a laser pointer? We can see your your pointer okay. pretty well. I'll do a laser point. All right, there's, oh, great. there's the North River. Here's the South River. Um, and here is the same exact area. And these are two satellite images taken by a satellite system called Landsat 8. Um, and I want to see if you can find the differences. And of course, this is inspired by my small children who love this in Highlights Magazine, spot the differences. So take a look at these two images. And we'll come back to it in a little bit. Oh, and Brian, this is a great point for me to, to mention something I forgot. Uh, if anyone has any questions during the presentation, feel free to put them in the Q&A section of uh, this presentation. Not in the chat, but in the Q&A. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much, Brian. All right. So I'll come back to those satellite images in a bit. First, I want to acknowledge uh, the, the work of all these folks here on the screen, as well as folks whom I didn't have time to grab their pictures, but were also um, involved in this work. Um, and I especially want to give a big shout out to my colleague, John Woodruff, um, who really uh, got me excited in the system. Um, this guy here is his graduate advisor, who has been working there as well, um, using the North-South Rivers channels as a way to understand sort of medium-sized estuaries, looking at fluid dynamics. He brought in my, my colleague, John, and myself to look at the salt marshes, and it's been a really exciting place to work. So I'm going to start with the main points of the talk. The main points I'd like to, to make is that um, uh, when the location of the inlet changed, high tide increased on the North River more than a foot. It was a big change. Um, a foot of sea level rise is the amount of sea level rise we've seen in the last century. Um, so this is a huge amount of sea level rise. And so it makes the North-South Rivers a natural laboratory where we can study how abrupt sea level rise may impact marshes. In the case of the North-South Rivers, I think you can see in this picture that the marshes are, are doing quite well. They're green and verdant and um, quite continuous. Um, and so what has allowed these marshes to be as resilient as they are? That's part of what I'll be talking about. Um, well, lots of sediment. Um, the amount of sediment deposited here on this marsh in a vertical sense is three times the amount of sea level rise we've had since then. Um, since the Portland Gale, the 1898 inlet switch. And the last thing I'll say is that that sediment mostly came from the ocean. Marine sediment is really important to tidal marsh systems. And I'll explain a little bit more about where marine sediment comes from and, and how that can impact the decisions we make um, as we manage the coastline. <laughs> I'm guessing most people are somewhat familiar with tidal marshes, um, but I did want to have just one slide explaining what a tidal marsh is. This is a schematic that I drew. Um, and so a lot of us think of what's above the ground surface, which is the beautiful grasses, it's beautiful landscapes that um, so many people love to depict in paintings and whatnot. Um, as a geoscientist, I'm often just as interested in what's happening below ground. Um, a lot of people are interested in the below ground portion for its carbon value, and its carbon value is a function of 
what percentage carbon the material is and how dense the soil is. And in general, close to the, the tidal channels, we have mineral rich sediment and farther from the tidal channels, we have more organic rich sediment. Um, and our group, and my research group has actually done quite a bit of work trying to quantify exactly how much carbon is in marshes. And I'll speak to that briefly as well. All right, so here is the object, uh, sort of object of our desire, the main subject of the talk, this Portland Gale of 1898 and how it changed um, the North South Rivers estuary. Um, again, I'm guessing this is a story that many folks are familiar with, but I, I want to make sure we bring everyone along, so I'll take my time here. So this is where the outlet of the North South Rivers used to be. And what you can see is that the very long North River Channel used to be six kilometers longer. The exit used to be down here in Wrexham. And I will do my best with uh, Massachusetts pronunciation, but I'm not from Massachusetts. Um, so down near Wrexham, which I would pronoun pronounce Wrexham if I didn't know better. And I think Brant Rock is just to the south here. So this is where the channel was for as long as uh, colonists were here making maps um, and unknown how it was there prior to that um, during long pre-colonial history. Um, but this is where it was from about the 1620s right up until 1898. And then as many folks know, um, on the day of the Portland Gale in, 189, in November of 1898, this beach right here, which is, was referred to as Shingle Beach, it's between Fourth Cliff and Third Cliff, was breached, and this became the new North-South Rivers Inlet. And of course, for a time, um, Hummer Rock was an island isolated by these two inlets. And so, of course, this is why Hummer Rock is part of Situate and not Marshfield. And again, I, I shouldn't speak to the local geography and history because um, I'm sure I'll make a mistake and there are folks who know much more than I do. But anyhow, uh, here where uh, Shingle Beach used to be, today we have what is still referred to as the new inlet, even though it's 126 years old now. Um, and what you can see is that the North River at that time shortened by about six kilometers. Um, and so the, what we're interested in is as that, that shortening of six kilometers occurred, how did it change the way that tides move up and down the river? And then ultimately, how did it change the salt marshes? So here is what the in that inlet looks like today. Here's Fourth Cliff with the uh, Army R&R facility. I forget what it's called. I think it's called Fourth Cliff. Um, and the big question is, how did that inlet switch affect the, marsh, the marshes and the estuarine channels, so the north and south rivers, um, so which I refer to as the estuarine channels? Um, really interesting. Uh, it, just in this picture, you can see, and anyone who's walked out off third, so third cliff is just off the left side of this image right here. Anyone who's walked out here knows that this is all salt marsh. It's salt marsh peat, um, but there's no grass. This was the salt marsh that was growing inside the estuary before the beach that used to be right here um, was breached. So this used to be a quiet back barrier location um, where salt marsh could thrive. And today, this sandy spit, which, which comes off of Third Cliff, is prograding, or, or reg I should say transgressing is the geologic term. It's moving toward landward across the salt marsh. And so this old salt marsh, um, it's not going to make it because it's way, too, it's too, way too exposed to the elements and energy, really, really high energy. All right, so when this switch happened, the channel became about six kilometers shorter or uh, almost four, four miles shorter. And so what we would expect is if the North River is closer to the ocean, it should receive higher high tides and lower low tides. And that's because friction slows down water as it moves along these windy channels. And so here we're looking at a graph of distance from the mouth. And I, I have to apologize, all the units are gonna be metric today because that's the language of scientists. So um, this is distance from the mouth, and this is the height of mean high water, or sort of the average high water from high tide. And what you can see is that close to the inlet, high tides are higher. Far from the inlet, low tides are lower. We can use the slope of this line, basically how much the high tide declines as you get further and further from the ocean, to calculate if we shorten the river uh, six kilometers, this distance, we should see a decrease in mean high water of about at this time, I thought it was 21 centimeters when I made the figure. Now we think it's closer to 30 centimeters, but somewhere on the order of about a foot. So, um, so if you shorten it six kilometers, you should see a rise in mean high water of about a foot. Now, we did most of these studies not knowing if that was the case or not. And when we got pretty close to publishing, um, I finally became aware of the incredibly rich um, 
history that's happening in the region, um, thanks to many local historians. Um, and just the other day, Lyle Nyberg shared this awesome report with me. This is a report from 1915. Um, and I wanted to highlight some text from it, um, where it says, uh, from Hanover Bridge uh, to the sea, the river winds its way, and he's talking about North River, through the marshes of various width whose surface is about one foot below high water. Now, anyone who knows salt marshes knows that the salt marsh is right around the mean high water line. But in 1915, um, it, was, it was about a foot below high water. Before the, present, the outlet was um, before the present outlet was created, the ordinary tides rose to about the level of the marshes. And the area of the marshes, oh, sorry, never mind. Uh, so that was what I wanted to read. So basically, this confirmed that our, our suspicion that the inlet switch, the shortening of the North River, caused an increase in the depth of high tides. And like I said, that's an effective increase in sea level and we could allowed us to study how have the marshes responded. So one of the first things we did was look at um, how, how deep the marshes are today under high water um, as you move upstream. And so we instrumented six locations along the North River, four locations along the South River. And at each of those locations, we measured how high is the marsh platform and how high is high tide. And what you can see um, is that in general, um, mean high water declines as you move upstream on either channel. And the salt marsh platform is somewhat tied to mean high water, um, but it, in both cases, um, it is today below mean high water. Um, and so we can use these two things to calculate how deep high water is over the marsh. Um, as you move farther upstream, uh, mean high water is still, high tides are still a little bit above the, uh, the marsh platform, so inundation here on the y-axis, distance from the mouth on the x-axis. And as you get closer to the ocean, the inundation depths are higher. What that means is if you're standing out on the marsh at, at low tide down in, down in situate, uh, you're going to be wet up to your thighs. If you're standing out on the marsh at, sorry, at high tide, if you're standing out on the marsh at high tide up higher along the river up in Hanover, um, you're only going to be up to your ankles or mid-calf. Um, and so we looked at how did the, the marsh respond. Now, we have a few historical accounts, but what we're really interested in is, is understanding sort of um, things that folks might not have been writing down, like how much sediment was getting delivered to the marsh, how much organic material was the marsh being storing in its soils. And so we can use these sediments uh, from the marsh platform. So here's me standing on top of the, um, the salt marsh um, right around, if anyone knows where Rote Marine is or where Route 3A crosses the North River. That's right near here. Um, and so what we do is we take sediment cores, and it would be similar to just taking a little bit, a little scoop of sediment off the side of the exposed bank. We do sediment cores because we're interested in getting a little bit away from the banks, um, but we could just as easily take a scoop off the side here. And then we measure various parameters all the way down the soil core um, to understand how things have changed back in time. <clears throat> and so um, if we look at, um, for instance, the uh, heavy metal lead, um, we often use this because the peak lead, or sorry, the onset of lead in soils often corresponds to the beginning of industrialization within an area. And we know across the South Shore, this corresponds to around 1900, which is a really convenient age constraint when we're interested in studying the Portland Gale of 1898. We did quite a bit of work to confirm that indeed this really unique change right here around 70 centimeters is the Portland Gale, is consistent with the timing of the Portland Gale and that change in the inlet location. But I'm going to spare you all the details then. Um, also, I realize this slide says Yellen et al. in prep. This is published. If anyone's interested in the publication, happy to send it to you. Um, guessing, uh, who knows? Anyway, welcome, to, happy to send it to you. Um, so what you can see is that it, it was really enriched in lead. And at the exact same time, the, uh, the second plot is showing the percent organic material um, against depth. And what you can see is right around the time of the Portland Gale, there was this big drop in the amount of organic material. And so what this leads us to understand is that instead of organic material, now the marsh was came to be dominated by mineral material. So right around the time of the Portland Gale, it switched from a pretty organic rich marsh platform to a much more mineral rich marsh platform. And so this is consistent with our understanding that if it got deeper, there's an ability to deliver more mineral sediment to the marsh platform. And as a result, the soils will become more mineral rich. Now, since the time of the Portland Gale or through the 20th century, the marsh has slowly recovered back to its 
sort of pre-gale condition. And now the soil is once again about um, around 50% organic material, 50% mineral material by mass. Um, and so, yeah, again, this line corresponds to around 1900. It's consistent with the timing of the Portland Gale. If we contrast that with the South River, so we're looking at the same two parameters. We're looking at depth versus the amount of lead in the soils. Um, we can see that um, the amount of accumulation on the South River has been about half as much as the amount of accumulation on the North River. And so what this tells us, again, it's consistent with the North River marshes being buried, uh, sorry, inundated quite deep with water right after the, the inlet switch. And also that the North River has accumulated sediment really fast. It's accumulated sediment around two and a half times the rate of sea level rise at this location. And so this is a great story of marsh resilience. This is an example of a marsh that has recovered really well from a really um, difficult disturbance that again, wasn't caused by humans for once, thank goodness. Um, it was this natural switch in the inlet location. Um, but we see in here an example of the North River Marsh being quite resilient to abrupt sea level rise. Um, and South River Marsh has sort of plugged along. The amount of deposition here is consistent with most marshes in the region sort of keeping up with sea level rise, but also indicative of a relatively resilient marsh. Um, lead 210 is how we date it. Uh, I, I'll spare you the details there. Um, and so I want to just give you a, a picture of what this, what this layer looks like in the field. And so here you can see this layer actually sticking out from the side of one of the, this is a ditch going up uh, along the North River Channel. It's down about 70, 75 centimeters, depending on where you are along the channel. So that's about two, two and a half feet. Um, and it's the reason it sticks out is because it's so organic rich, it's much more um, fibrous and resistant to erosion. Um, and so it sticks out from the, the bank a little bit. And it gave us a really easy way to sort of date things and compare the amount of deposition across the marsh. So we use that layer and the onset of lead associated with that layer um, to look at how much deposition there has been since the Portland Gale all the way up the North River Channel. So here we are looking at stations one through six, all the way up almost to the head of tides. Um, here's Indian Head Reservoir. So number six is, is close to, to where it becomes, uh, stops being tidal, um, and certainly within the freshwater tidal marsh. Um, and so here you could see at station one, so this is the most seaward location. I'm sorry, my labels seem to have come off. So this is station one closest to the ocean. This is landward. This is station six furthest from the ocean. And there's two big things I want you to take away. One is the location of this dashed black line, which tells us how much deposition there's been since the Portland Gale. Basically close to the ocean, right where that sediment all of a sudden started flooding into the estuary, there has been a ton of deposition, four to five times as much as the amount of sea level rise. So if our salt marsh keeping pace with sea level rise, we'd expect those numbers to be about the same. There's been about a foot of sea level rise since the Portland Gale. We'd expect about a foot of, of deposition or, or 30 centimeters of sea level rise, 30 centimeters of deposition. And here we see a ton of deposition. And so that marsh was being inundated quite deep right after the inlet switch. Um, and it has uh, accumulated a lot of sediment to try to keep up. Um, and as you move landward, the amount of sediment deposited on the marsh platform after the Portland Gale decreases. Um, but even as far as, as, as N6, all the way up here, it's twice as much as the South River deposition. So one big takeaway is um, a lot of deposition since the Portland Gale. These marshes have responded to, to that increase in sea level um, or increase in mean high water um, by, by building vertically quite quickly. The other thing that's interesting <clears throat> um, is that as you look landward, the lead levels are incredibly high. The x-axis here is parts per million. And so we have lead levels at 4,000 parts per million, means that the soil two feet down up here is 4% lead by mass. It's some of the highest lead contamination, I think. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen a published lead contamination this high anywhere. Um, for example, the San Francisco Bay Estuary is sort of the poster child for lead contamination due to the legacy of gold mining up in the mountains of the Sierra Nevada and all that lead came down to um, San Francisco Bay Area. There, the lead levels are around 500 parts per million. 
So these are eight times higher than the poster child for lead contamination. Um, that said, it's buried. It's well below grade, and it, I don't think it poses a human or, or ecological health risk, but it's sort of interesting to know. And of course, as you might have seen in the slide here, the reason for this is the Superfund site up in, this is in Hancock. Um, and so this was this is known as the fireworks site, and the um, environmental consulting firm Tetra Tech, I believe, has done most of the work there. Um, I'm not an expert on it, but we sort of looked into, geez, where's all this lead coming from? Um, uh, and so this sediment out towards the ocean is very clean sediment, which means it must not be coming from the watershed. It has to be coming from the ocean. So this is our first piece of evidence that marine sediment is really important. And this is part of what has made the North River so resilient to this abrupt sea level rise. All right, I'm going to uh, try to speed up a little bit. Um, this is a really busy plot. Um, I think I'll just cut to the chase and say that um, the, because the, with the inlet switch happened and you had higher high tides and lower low tides on the North River, you had to move more water in and out of the North River Channel. And so there's been quite a bit of erosion along the channel banks since 1898. Interestingly, the erosion has been somewhat constant. So from 1870 to 1960, and from 1960 to 2019, the rate of erosion was pretty similar. And the net result is the North River today is about 18% wider than it was before the inlet switch. So about 20% wider than it was before the inlet switch. Um, and I think that's all I'll say there. I'll spare you the details of how I did it. But interestingly, what you can see is, you could see the evidence of this in the North-South Rivers, the way they look. The North River today is deep and relatively clear of shoals. It's relatively navigable at high water. And the South River has all these sandy shoals in it. Um, and I think the reason for this is that the South River, it used to have bigger tides. Before the inlet switch, it was closer to the ocean. It was a shorter channel. Um, and then when, they, when the inlet switch occurred, it became a much longer channel. Its channel got longer by six kilometers. And as a result, um, it no longer needed this big channel to convey all the water. And as a result, the channel bottom abraded with sand. And you can see that if you look at aerial photos of the South River, it's got these big sandy shoals. So how did the marsh platform adjust to the inlet switch? Uh, it, in sort, this is sort of a summary slide. So in 1898, along the North River, the, um, this green represents the, the marsh, the landscape that you would have been walking on. This darker blue represents the inundation at high tide. Um, and from 1898 to 1899, there was this jump in water levels. And then from 1899 to present, there's been quite a bit of marsh deposition on the marsh, but at the same time, there's been quite a bit of compaction of that sediment. Um, and we think part of the reason for that is that the, the sediment is so mineral rich. Um, it's mineral rich, therefore it's dense. And so it's just heavy enough to sort of weigh down on the underlying marsh peat. Nevertheless, um, you know, the, the marsh is, does seem to be keeping up with sea level rise. <clears throat> and so to return to our question, um, what is the difference between these two images? Hopefully folks picked up on the fact that there's all this sediment in the water column in the November uh, image, whereas in the October image, the water is quite clear. And if you look at this picture, you can see where the sediment is coming from. It's not coming from the estuary itself. The estuary is exporting this really clear black water plume. Rather, the sediment is coming off of the headlands. So what this is showing us is that coastal erosion is actually one of the main suppliers of sediment to the coastal system. And it's sort of uh, an unfortunate um, story to tell, um, but I do want to tell it because it's the truth. It's uh, if we want beaches, if we want mudflats to, to hunt for shellfish, and if we want salt marshes, they're all dependent on a, readily, a ready supply of sediment. Our rivers in the Northeast are incredibly clear and have very little sediment in them. Um, and so our abundant sedimentary environments at the coast, our beaches, our shellfish flats, and our salt marshes are, are dependent on this supply of, of sediment from coastal erosion, which is a really weird thing to, to think about, but that is the case. Um, I'm going to skip this plot, um, and I think I'll skip this as well. Um, so let's talk about just the coastal erosion. Folks are probably familiar with this. This, again, is Fourth Cliff. This is a prime example of really rapid coastal erosion. And I'm sure for the folks who are, uh, love this property up here on Fourth Cliff, they are not happy about the coastal erosion. Um, 
But I will say for everyone who loves Hummer Rock Beach all the way down from here, um, Hummer Rock Beach is made from the material of this eroding cliff. Um, for the people who love the North South Rivers estuary marshes, it as well is made from the sediment of eroded from Fourth Cliff as well as Third Cliff and, and elsewhere. Um, and so I'll finish just by, by alluding to a few projects that are happening at UMass these days to understand these processes a little bit better. One thing we're doing is we're looking at um, how much sediment is in the coastal ocean um, and how that has been changing through time. And so I'm showing here um, a time series. So time is on the x-axis divided into five-year bins. And on the y-axis, I'm showing, um, I should have relabeled this red band, I should have relabeled it, sorry, um, sediment in the water column or suspended sediment. Um, and so these orange boxes represent how much sediment was in the water column in the 80s and 90s. And then you can see it drops off toward the present. And so what this means is that there's less and less sediment in the water column in it, off the coast of um, South Shore, Massachusetts. I should mention we've been doing this across the Northeast US, and we're actually just scaling up to doing it across the whole world. Um, of course, we're doing this with um, some big data tools, um, and we use satellite remote sensing. So we use satellite imagery that go back to the 1980s to do this. But the big takeaway is um, the amount of sediment in the coastal ocean in Massachusetts is declining. Um, and the reason for this, we think may be the armoring of the coastline. And so again, just to choose an example close to home, and I wanna emphasize, we're doing these studies across the Northeast, so, um, and, and, and soon to be across the whole world. Um, but since I, I do have such a love and fondness for the, 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 the North South River estuary, um, it was a nice opportunity to look up some images from what Third Cliff, in this case, looked like in 1913, and what it looks like today. And here you can see in 1913, um, it was this quote unquote natural, of course, you know, nothing's natural, humans are part of the environment. Anyhow, natural is a loaded term, but what I would say is it's a, it has some rate of erosion. And as this bluff was being eroded and dropped into the ocean, that was the material that provided um, provided sand for Peggotty Beach and sand for Hummer Rock Beach and um, provided fine grain material that could be transported into the North South Est River estuaries for shellfish beds and, and salt marshes. Today, of course, that mostly has been shut off. There are still some small pockets of erosion. You can see this one section of armored coastline, um, maybe during a really high wave event, some waves are still accessing that, but no doubt the property owner there will, will remedy that shortly. Um, and so often we think of erosion as a bad word, but it's really um, an, an important part, a critical part of, of coastal processes. One other side note I'd like to make is that um, another thing that's happening at the UMass uh, Sediment and Coastal Dynamics Lab is looking at blue carbon. And so if I figured folks uh, in the area might be interested in sort of what is the value of our marshes, not just from uh, intrinsic and ecological value, but also from potentially future carbon markets. And so this is something else we've been doing at UMass. Um, we've mapped the amount of um, organic material. This is this first map, the amount of the bulk density of the soil, as well as the carbon density. So how much carbon is in the soil for all the salt marshes in the Northeast US. Um, and so this is just showing you the map for the North South Rivers estuary. And so we can come up with a very um, accurate estimate of how much carbon is being stored there um, every year. Um, and if that's something that groups are interested in, that might be something that can help with. Um, but so I figured it was worth reaching out about. We also have mapped out how much mineral sediment is in the salt marsh. And again, if we know the rate at which the salt marsh is building, we can figure out how much mineral sediment does it need each year. And, and once we do that, we can start thinking about where is it going to come from. Um, we are going to continue armoring our coastlines. It's important to protect critical infrastructure. It's important to protect people's property. We know that. Um, and yet at the same time, we need to shift our perspective from viewing sediment as this problem that clogs up our, our, um, our navigable channels and view it as a resource. Often sediment gets dredged out of channels and dumped offshore and that cannot continue. We need to keep that sediment in our estuarine systems because it's really important and we have less of it every day. Um, so just uh, reiterate some main points. Sediment comes mostly from the ocean, not from our rivers. Waves and erosion are supplying the sediment to our marshes. 
and it's a, it's a finite resource. Um, and so I think I'll end it there and see if there are any questions. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's obvious. That's uh, just really, uh, really interesting, Brian. Um, there are a few questions that I can field for you. Um, what are the implications uh, of erosion for kayakers and boaters? And I do know, you know, I've spent a lot of time kayaking on both rivers, and I do know during the South River, even on a high tide scenario, there are a lot of sandy shoals in it where it gets very shallow in so many areas. So what are sort of the implications of this erosion, you know, for people who want to use the waterways for, for traveling? Oh, it's a great question. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, so the, the erosion of the North River channel um, doesn't seem to have impacted the depths. That said, I'm probably one of the least knowledgeable people about the depth of the North River system. I know it from like a, a data standpoint, but I don't know it from a daily boating standpoint, which I think is a much more a richer and probably more accurate source of knowledge. Um, but, you know, our understanding would be that the North River has really, um, you know, substantial tides and those channels should be naturally maintained. On the South River, um, that seems not to be the case. We you know we've had this reduction in tides since 1898, and as a, that's that's sort of what we chalk up the shoaling there too. But really interesting to hear if, if folks have experienced that from a boating and navigation standpoint. That's interesting. Um, so just around Couch Beach, there's a corduroy highway, a, a bunch of logs perpendicular that. Uh, was a way for like uh, people to um, uh, bring up boats or reload packet uh, landings along the banks of the river. There are some logs. So Couch Beach is like halfway up. It's like okay. sort of a good middle point of the North River. Um, there are some logs that are sticking out about three to four foot below the current high tide today. So you're saying that the sediment raised the land by around three to four feet? Yeah, that's a that's so cool. Um, and I'm guessing um that that the person who asked the question probably has some idea of how old that that corduroy road is and that's exactly the, yeah the, so the way we're using lead as our as our marker or as a sediment as a we call it a like a time horizon um that corduroy road is a fantastic example of a time horizon so if you had you know if you find it on a map um you could get a good idea of yeah exactly the time that it took for that sediment to accumulate but exactly right and um you know, and I think uh, Lyle and other historians have shared with me examples of the North River Boathouse used to be um, basically on the marsh. Um, I forget exactly where, I forget exactly which bridge, but probably folks in the audience know. And the North I, North Reservation, just just a, uh, yeah. above um, or down uh, up river from um, the Union Street Bridge Street Bridge. Exactly, Union Street Bridge. That's right. Yeah, and so that was an example of one. You know, they, they you know. They had a little bit of nuisance flooding maybe before the inlet switch, and then afterwards they were like, this is untenable. Our, our boathouse is flooded all the time. Um, but yeah, so that's exactly the right conclusion to draw, that that three to four feet of sediment on top of the corduroy road represents 126 years of, of accumulation. Um, suspended sediment now must reflect uh, the beach nourishment happening on Duxbury Beach is is uh, this is not a normal change. So it looks like a comment sort of about some of the beach nourishment that is happening, especially in the Duxbury area. Um, yeah, so I mean, you know, um, there's a few reasons that we quote unquote need to nourish our beaches nowadays, um, but certainly one of it, one of them is that we've altered the supply of sediment to our beaches. Um, many places in the world, um, the beaches reflect offshore oceanographic conditions, meaning that high energy beaches tend to be more cobbly, low energy beaches tend to be sandier. Um, our Massachusetts beaches, that is not the case. Our Massachusetts beaches, they look like the eroding bluff at the up at the sort of up up current end of the beach. So if that up current, if that bluff is really sandy, you get a really nice sandy beach. If that bluff has lots of cobbles in it, you get a cobbly beach. So in the case of Hummerock, you know, it's eroding fourth cliff. It's eroding uh, a glacial till, which has lots of rock in it. And so that's why part of why Hummerock is so cobbly and other beaches are not. It's it's pretty unique. Um, and it's a function of our glacial history. Um, most places in the world, beaches do not operate like that. That's interesting. Um, 
is the, and I, I don't know if this is a question that you can feel, Brian, but uh, is the federal government uh, concerned about doing anything about the erosion of Fourth Cliff? So the Fourth Cliff is um, okay. owned by Hanscom Air Force, Air Force Department of Defense. Uh, historically, that old tower there is an old lookout submarine hunting tower from World War II. So um, uh, as far as you know, Brian, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, it's one of the coolest coastal features, in my opinion, in That's Massachusetts. Cool. Um, I'm I'm leading a field trip for the um, the regional the national natural resource conservation service. They're the the federal government agency that maps all the soils for the United States. I'm leading a field trip out there in July, um, and it's sort of an unparalleled place for geologists to go check out and and soils people. Um, that said, are they going to do anything about the erosion? I have no idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I do. I have done a program there um, with members of the Air Force, an educational program for local situate schools, and they they are certainly concerned about it, um, not only for the infrastructure, but also they are taking into consideration it being shorebird habitat for red knots as well. So um, I, I do know that they are trying to figure out a solution uh, to that, but as, as that's as far as I can speak to that. So um, could sediment be added to the marsh system from... Uh, upstream sources? Yeah, that's a super interesting question. I think, um, you know, as sea level rise accelerates, I think we're going to have to be creative about where to get sediment if we want to keep our beaches and we want to keep our shellfish habitat and we want to keep our salt marshes. So I think we need to look at, you know, where are there places where they have problem sediment? One example is navigational channels. Um, right now, a a frightening amount of sediment still gets dumped in the middle of Cape Cod Bay um, by U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Um, there's a sediment disposal um, area marked on bathymetric maps of Cape Cod Bay, navigational maps. Um, and so this represents the place where these barges are scooping sediment out of estuaries and taking it offshore. Um, it's like, it would be like, it'd be like shoveling money out of your bank account and dumping it on the street um, or worse, right? At least if it goes on the street, someone could get it. It'd be like, shoveling out of your bank account and I don't know putting it into a fire it's 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 really um frustrating from a from a coastal geologist standpoint um so there is a question about some of the uh the ditching um whether it's mosquito ditching or the trenches in the north river um the long trenches that have been cut into the marshes years ago are these helpful or problematic yeah so that is a great way to start a fight amongst a bunch of coastal geomorphologists um Certainly, human modifications to, to systems are generally frowned upon. Um, there is quite a bit of evidence that um, really dense ditch ditching, so like where the ditches are really close to each other, results in net subsidence of the marsh, so it's actually lose, it loses elevation. The reason for that is if you have better drained soils, which was, which was part of the goal of ditching, is you get more oxygen into the soil, and oxygen is what can allow microbes to eat up the organic material. As they eat the organic material, the whole marsh starts to collapse. Most of the marsh is made out of organic material. Um, and so certainly from that standpoint, ditches can be quite bad. Um, I would say the broad consensus is that yeah, marshes are not, are not great. At lower density, however, there is some evidence that they might reduce the amount of ponding on marshes. So one thing that the North-South River system does not really suffer from is really extensive um, ponds that are sort of expanding and resulting in marsh loss. Other systems around, around the region certainly have major ponding issues. And I personally haven't seen big issues north south river. And I think part of it is in part because the ditches are, are somewhat effective at preventing it. Um, but that is, it's a very controversial topic. Um, why did the original river open? So the original inlet um, at Wrexham, why did they close after the events of 1898 and, and how quickly did that happen? Oh, it's a great question. Um, the historians in the room definitely know exactly how long it took. I know that there were cruise boats that, that cruised around Hummer Rock Island. And I think that was for about 10 years. Um, if Lyle, I think Lyle's in the room, he can, he can certainly correct me. I think it was on the order of uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, uh, and then it probably closed due to longshore transport. If you looked at the map of the, the pre-1898 map, um, and I, I can just share that real quick. Uh, um, oops. In this map, uh, you can see that, um, you see this spit, how it's built to the south. 
in the absence of tidal flushing to keep that channel open, that spit will just close up eventually. And so the process by which sand moves parallel to the shore is called longshore transport. And it's a function of the dominant wave direction. So in this region, the dominant wave direction is from the north. Um, and so our, our longshore transport is to the south. And so it just closed up that inlet eventually. That's interesting. I, a little caveat, uh, the, the I know that the shipbuilders, the shipbuilding on the North River was so extensive. Um, they had tried really hard to dredge uh, inlet where the current inlet is um, to uh, uh, quickly, more quickly get the unfinished hulls out into the coastal shipyards. Uh, about, so the last ship that was launched, the Helen M. Foster, was around 1870, I do believe. Um, and then, so it was a sort of a cruel twist of fate that just, you know, less than 20 years after the last ship was built, that mouth that they had wanted to open up had, had opened. So um, kind of interesting timing there. Um, predictions uh, for the, and thanks again, Brian, for fielding these questions. And thanks all, there's still 124 folks here listening in. So thanks so much for your time. Um, predictions for the marshes, if climate change leads to increased sea level um, and more intense storms, what do you... What do you what do you predict? Yeah, great question. Um, so you know the the story of the North South River I think is somewhat of a of a hopeful one. It is a system that seems to have quite a bit of sediment in the system, and so we have quite a bit of sediment available to the system. Um, and so the hope is that it will be somewhat resilient. Um, it's not an if, but a how much in terms of climate change and sea level rise. Um, I I I don't believe there's any uncertainty about um, whether the sea level rise will accelerate. The, of course, there is uncertainty as to what collectively we're gonna do about it. Um, that we're gonna do about carbon in the atmosphere specifically. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of sea level rise. I do think other systems are certainly gonna be less resilient, um, not as able, able to adapt as quickly um, because they, they are showing already more signs of wear. Another thing that is helpful in the South Shore is relatively large tides. Um, south of the Cape, tides are, are what we call microtidal, so the tidal range is only a couple feet in most cases. In some cases, as little as one or one and a half feet. Those microtidal settings have much less resilience. The salt marshes have much less resilience to sea level rise. In the, these big tides are helpful for getting sediment out over the marsh platform, um, as we as we saw in 1898. Um, um, but um, so the south of the Cape. Buzzards Bay, those marshes are are likely going to need some significant intervention. Um, thanks, Brent. Looks like there's a comment here. Um, someone who might be knowledgeable of uh, the the dredging. They, he's saying only clean, fine grained dredged sediment is deposited out in the the Cape Cod Bay area. So, yeah, yeah. Certainly, they they like the sand for beach nourishment. Um, but I, the, the fine grain stuff just as valuable, in my opinion, it, it's been viewed as, as waste, um, for decades, but uh, I think maybe that's what the comment is supposed to say. Okay. Um, so, uh, let's see, going back to old log, uh, couch beach, uh, so go, going back to the old log road by couch beach, what is the tide level lower? Oh, was the tide level lower or did the log road sink? That's a great question. Both probably. Yeah, both. So if there's four feet of sediment on top of the log road, it doesn't necessarily mean that there's been, uh, the land is four feet higher today. Um, it means that the land might be two and a half feet higher and the log road has sunk a foot and a half. Um, so it's some combination of accumulation on top of the log road and then net sinking of the log road. Okay, thanks, Brian. Um, do you, f what are some issues or do you foresee any issues considering uh, shell fishing in, in our mudflats and, shell and shellfish beds? Yeah, great question. And this is a, an issue that the, the UMass Sediment Group is just starting to think about. Um, we're hoping to, we haven't done much field work yet in, in intertidal mudflat environments. Um, potentially there'll be winners and losers, depending on whether you're talking about some of the, the bivalves that like to live in soft sediment, uh, you know, the mud, versus the sand, um, you know, I do have a fear that we're, that there's gonna be less and less mud in the coastal system. Um, and so things like steamers and razor clams that tend to live in the muddier environments, actually, I don't know about razor clams, someone can correct me, um, but certainly steamers in the muddy environments, um, there may be less of that 
of that sediment available. Real, I really don't know though. It's a, it's an area that I'm excited to jump into and, and not too many folks are thinking about it. There's a group up in Maine that's starting to think about it um, and some great research being led by Manomet um, up in Maine, working with shellfishers to try to understand how sea level rise is gonna impact our access, sea level rise and potentially sediment changes our access to shellfish, our shellfish resources. Oh, Manomet here in, in Plymouth. Manomet, yep. I'm sorry. Oh, um, I know some folks there. Uh, let's see, do uh, city urban planning departments use your studies to better plan for future developments uh, in the watershed areas and coastlines? Yeah, great question. So um, that that study we're doing where we're looking at how much sediment is available in the water column, we're trying to work with all the states in the Northeast and we're working with um, uh, the folks who are sort of in charge of coastal policy. But one thing that I don't, I mean, I'm a physical scientist and I'm not a social scientist and I don't have a great grasp on who makes decisions about how individual properties and individual project, product, projects. As you move along the coast, you can see some coastlines um, are being um, armored through large municipal efforts and you have sort of a, the same construction that can extend for miles along the coast. And then you go to certain coastlines and you can see each individual property owner at the parcel level has invested in their own um, armoring strategy. There is a big movement nationwide toward what's called living shorelines, trying to move away from these um, engineered, um, what they call gray infrastructure and move more toward green infrastructure. You know, to what extent could we use things like oysters um, and natural rock reefs that are slightly offshore to lessen wave energy and protect their coast instead of, um, you know, turning our coastline into a, a solid wall. Um, again, it's something that I'm starting to learn about, but I'm certainly no expert, so I don't want to speak too much. Interesting. Just uh, just a couple more, Brian, and thanks for your time. Um, do you find any impacts from the Boston Sand and Gravel Operations, 1915, 1963? Uh, in between that time, I know Situate had a huge one going on there by Driftway. Lyle's been holding out on me. I, he hasn't <laughs> asked me about this until right now, and I, I'd love to learn more offline, Lyle. It's a great question. Um, I, I don't know, but I hope you can tell me more about it later. Um, let's see how, so the old, like Damon's points, old rail bed there, um, would you know of the old train tracks along the river where, where it really bottlenecks it right early on, how that could affect the marshes? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a great question. I don't know what that tra rail trestle might have looked like when it was active. You know, if, uh, I know there's been like controversy through the centuries over like, uh, the shipbuilding industry versus, you know, bridges across the river, it'd be hard to get through if you had rail bridges. If it, if it, if it was a pretty substantial bridge, it, it might have attenuated tides even more than just the long channel. And, and so potentially it was the combination of both the, the rail bridge coming out and the 1898 gale that, that increased tides along the North River. Um, that's a great question. I don't know. That's a good question. Um, so how far, so I know part of this question, how far up does the tide reach on the North River and how does um, saltiness or sedimentation vary? So I do know that the tide does go all the way up to the head of Tide Dam at Ludden's Ford there along the Hanover and Pembroke line. Um, and I have never noticed any saltiness because we'll do kayak and swim programs there. We have never seen any saltiness make its way up there. Um, but Brian, could you speak to, you know, the set, sedimentation and saltiness up in that area? Yeah, up good question. So, I mean, one thing, one way we measure saltiness is we look at the marsh vegetation. Once you see the transition from, from salt marsh grasses to cattails, um, it tells you that the water that's making it onto the marsh platform is pretty much fresh because cattails will not tolerate much salinity. And I, I think that happens around kilometer 14 or 15. And so, the, uh, yeah, the North River is, oh, sorry, no, I'm forgetting the numbers, around kilometer 10. The North River, I think, is 16 kilometers long. And so the first 10 kilometers are salt marsh. The last six are freshwater tidal marsh. And apologies again for metric. Um, and, um, but yeah, the two-thirds salt, one-third fresh, freshwater tidal. But of course, there might be a little salt water going along the bottom of the channel, even once it transitions to the cattails. You do get some stratification um, in estuaries with salt water on the bottom and fresh water on top. That said, the North River is pretty well mixed because it's not very deep. Deep estuaries can be quite stratified. Um, so 
times like in the Hudson River estuary where you can have salt water on the bottom and fresh water on top and they're sort of going in opposite directions. Um, to speak to the sedimentation, way, 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 way more sedimentation close to the ocean. Yeah, the, the amount of sediment being delivered to the marsh platform is really high close to the ocean um, and it's quite low as you get up toward um, Danaher. Thanks, Brian. I do, I've been told uh, the Route 3, the highway, over the North River is a good sort of uh, uh, a gauge of the transition between heavily Spartine alternoflora and the heavily cattail. Sort of ah, right, cool. right there, kind of is a good way. On either side, there is sort of a difference to see um, as cool. it starts to transition. So um, that's a good question. Um, are dam removals uh, adding the need, the needed sediment to these marshes? Yeah, great question about about dam removals. Um, so our group actually did a, a, a big project in the Hudson River estuary about dam removals. We studied the aggregate potential of 1,700 dams in the Hudson River estuary to increase the amount of sediment available to, to tidal wetlands downstream of those, those small dams distributed throughout the watershed. And what we found is actually that, that dams don't hold that much sediment. Um, in, and what sediment they do hold is often quite coarse. It often tends to be more sand and less of the, the silts and clays that make up our, our salt marshes. Um, so we didn't see a big impact, uh, a big impact from, from damming. That said, every bit helps and it's, it's certainly going to help our beaches and our, our fine grain sediment environments as well, the beaches and the marshes. Um, so it, it didn't seem like a panacea or a silver bullet, um, but, but um, but certainly every bit helps. And of course, fish passage being a primary goal of dam removals is, is super important as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's a big, big mission of the watershed for sure is fish passage and dam removal. Um, one more, uh, clean fine grain dredge sediment is being sprayed along marshes uh, along mid-Atlantic states to elevate them in response to elevated sea level rise. Can we do that here in New England? Um, thin, no! <laughs> thin layers to minimize uh, any marine uh you know ecological impacts we cannot do it because it's illegal in massachusetts um and this is a, another issue of contention so the the act the the process of, of putting sediment spraying it up onto marshes from from dredge projects um is widespread it's somewhat controversial but there's certainly some 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 uh good success stories from this process called thin layer placement um but it is currently illegal in Massachusetts. You are not, you cannot get a permit to put any fill on a marsh. When I'm interested in, if I ever wanna do an experiment on a marsh and I wanna bring out a couple bags of topsoil from a garden center, and if I wanted to spread it on a marsh, uh, you know, a couple inches thick, I'm, it's illegal. I literally cannot even get a research permit to do that. Um, that said, it, it may be changing in the coming years. Um, but it is it is currently illegal to do thin layer placement in Massachusetts. That's why we don't see it. It's really common, yeah, in New Jersey and Chesapeake Bay, but not in Massachusetts. That's such a, what, do you think that would help here? Yeah, great question. Uh, uh, like I said, it's controversial the the process, but um, I think we need to explore all possible avenues. Like anything, an emerging restoration technique when it's done poorly or and they make mistakes, it, it generates a lot of bad press, but I don't think we, we should abandon experimentation. And I, I think, yeah, there's gonna be a lot of sea level rise and I think we need to explore all possible tools um, before the situation is totally dire. Understood, understood. Well, thanks. Uh... Thanks, Brian. It's, I mean, incredibly fascinating, especially for someone who spends a lot of time on both the North and South Rivers. Uh, uh, so we really appreciate your time tonight. And thanks all of you for uh, for joining us uh, once again for our, winter, our Water Watch Lecture Series. Um, so tonight we were joined by Brian Yellen, PhD, Research Professor of Geosciences, Hydrology, and Sedimentology at UMass Amherst Coastal Dynamics Lab. Brian, thanks so much for your time tonight. Really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I, I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Uh, and thanks, Julia, with Mass Audubon. We're always really excited to partner with you uh, for the for this program, as well as many others going forward. So thanks, Julia, for your time tonight as well. Yeah, thank you for having me. This was really great. Um, my uh, background is in geology, actually, so it was really interesting to hear about. Nice. Very cool. Um, so... Once again, thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, a big thank you to our sponsors, Clean Harbors, as well as the Massachusetts Cultural Councils of Situate, Hanover, 
Marshfield, Pembroke, Rockland, Plymouth, and Duxbury. Thank you so much for your support. Obviously, a few towns in here are essential in the river that we were talking about tonight all along their coast uh, in marshes. So, um, so thank you to our sponsors once again. And uh, I, I'm Brian Taylor with the North and South Rivers Watershed Association. Really appreciate you joining us tonight. And have a good night, everyone. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Julia. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night.